What's up, everyone? Welcome to Dipped in Tone. I'm Rhett. I'm Zach. We've got a very special episode today. It's taken three whole years to get our guest on the <laughs> podcast, but we finally did it. We got it. We got it. We got it. We got it. Well, Josh Scott's a hard man get... to nail down. So, so yes. you know, we, <laughs> we <laughs> yeah. finally did it. You know, we had um, our people talk to his people and it was a whole thing, but here we are. Man, I want people. I mean, I know I have a couple people, but I want like <laughs> someone to like handle my stuff. I'll run, you know I'll saying? run PR for you. If you're cool with <laughs> emails never getting answered and DMs going unanswered, then yeah. <laughs> Did you check that? Oh, I saw it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I marked I it under red. <laughs> yeah. No, I saw it. Yeah. Sorry, oh, man. man. Every email will start with, hey, so sorry I missed this. Um, <sighs> yeah. I, That's real life. Uh, yeah. I can't even get started on that. So how are you doing? <laughs> Good. Uh, been really busy burning mm-hmm. the candle at both ends. Um, but overall pretty good. Can't complain. Yeah. Um, but since the last time we did a pod, did I see you? Was that, did the analog happen or have we had a pod since then? No, the analog happened. Wait. And then, no, do we have, no, no, we, mm-hmm. we've, we, we analogued then potted. Yes. Since. Okay. Right. All right. So it's been, the, the, so for me, I've been traveling and like, when that happens, I don't know, this probably happens to you too. It's like every weekend you're like going somewhere, my whole brain just goes and oh, yeah. it stops working. So I went oh, to yeah. Auburn, Alabama yep. to Spicer's Music and did a, like they had a, a in-store event. And then the following weekend, I went up to Chicago uh, for Reverb and CME's uh, Boutique Effects Pedal Showcase. And nice. uh, it was really fun. And I got it to see- It looked like a good like, time. Oh man, it's so great. M- Matthew and I went on a road trip we just drove up because we had to like take all our stuff. Um, so we just drove up real early and hung out. And it was great to see everybody. I got to see all, I got to see Josh. I got to see Joel from Chase Bliss. I got to see Philippe from Caroline. I got to see like ev- literally, literally almost everyone was there, like, you know, from the pedal brands. So it was very fun. And I got to play some very vintage, a very expensive and vintage electric guitars so nice was matthew Fine just talking fun. about his uh, destiny inventory on the entire drive up <laughs> <laughs> so when i'm running raids <laughs> I, these are the exotics i like to have in my inventory no no we we talked a lot about you know this music and nonsense and uh what we would do if we ran you know fender or something you know oh yeah uh, uh just that sort of stuff for eight hours so Man. you know pretty normal i want to go next time you will. We'll get you in there. Nice. Um, but yeah, man. Well, cool. We're going to keep this intro short because we uh, have quite a long interview with Josh today, which I'm really yes, excited about. So I um, want to give a quick shout out to our patrons. Thank you so much for supporting the show. If you want more information on what's included in our Patreon, the different tiers, what kind of access you get, like the uh, Patreon only Discord server and the ability to watch the show while we're recording it. All that is linked in the description box or the show notes if you are listening. And uh, we appreciate it. It's a great way to support us over here at Dipped in Tone. Yeah. And we want to thank Sweetwater for sponsoring this episode. If you're like me and you're jonesing for a 335 because you played a vintage one, you just go to sweetwater.com and check out all the 335s that you can buy uh, on their website. And you can, uh, add one to your personal arsenal like I have been doing, looking at the guitar gallery and choosing the best weights. Or check so. out the uh, the Sweetwater Use Gear Marketplace because who knows, maybe uh, uh, maybe a vintage one will pop up there. Get on that gear exchange. Get on that it's gear like, exchange. You know guys take about. Ethereum? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. I don't Probably think so. Probably not, yeah. But all right, thanks well, to Sweetwater for sponsoring this. Yeah, links in the description. You guys know what to do. Um, all right. The man, the myth, the legend, JHS himself is joining us on the podcast today. So without further ado, here's our friend, Josh Scott. <laughs> we're, we're doing it, man. We're in the red. <laughs> oh, God. I wish we could have gone live 15 seconds earlier than we did because, my God, that was great. <laughs> I got uh, to put you up here on my my, my monetaire. Man. I was just commenting. It's a a privilege and honor. It's like I'm on YouTube right now, like I'm watching a JHS video. Maybe one day y'all can come out and be here with me in the space where dreams are made. (laughs) We can all just be together. (laughs) Just in that one room. Is my audio level too hot, too good? My camera look good? No, you're good. You're all right. My hair looks all good. Be fine. You look great. Your green screen's looking good. Your uh, (laughs) backdrop there is looking nice. Thanks for joining us, man. Welcome to the uh, the show. It's been three years in the making, something like that, to get you on here. But here we are. It's been pretty funny 
how ridiculous getting on this show has been. <laughs> Pretty exclusive, man. We don't we don't let just anybody up here, you know. So I hear you have to own a couple dumbbells to get on this podcast. Just a couple. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're like That's uh, a requirement. Is it is it Ferrari where it's like in order to buy a good Ferrari, you have to prove that you've owned two or three other Ferraris, and then they'll maybe put you on a list to give you the opportunity to buy. Is that the, real? The, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we're like that. I didn't I didn't know this. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty cool. I don't know if we should let you vet emails anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for joining us. It's good to be here. I'm I'm currently looking like a I'm like I've turned elderly just now and I can't find one setting that I've seen a hundred. You ever do that? Where uh-huh. you're like, mm-hmm. where's the thing that's supposed to be there? Text one of your kids and they'll just tell yeah, you immediately. Dude. It's so <laughs> real. You've been a pretty busy man recently launching a, a new pedal line, right? Yep. 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 <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. i tell you what. Uh, it's, it's hard to do stuff, really anything, let alone like a entire brand launch is a doozy, man. It was super fun though, but yeah, it was, it was one of these projects. I'm sure you've all had them in your own way where it's like, it's a passionate thing. Like I'm doing this, like I feel a high calling to do this. And then by the time you get to the end of it, you're like, do I ever have to look at this again? Like (laughs) It could, the documentary yeah. edits and all that stuff, but it did like, it kind of hit me a few days after I was like, this is freaking awesome. Like we pulled this off, but man, it was such a long project. Like the documentary, I, it was kind of a two year, just everything it took about two solid years of like, you know, working on it consistently in, in a way that wouldn't like burn us all out. But man, it's it a blast to get it done for sure. Man, just the documentary alone was amazing. And that's that's something I really love about what you guys do. I mean, the pedals and, and the pedal company is is its own thing, but just the YouTube channel, as someone that does that for a living, I am constantly blown away by what you and Nick and the whole team over there do. It's like from my perspective, I look at JHS and the the YouTube channel and what you guys do as like the yardstick of quality that I want to try and maintain and try and strive to because I mean, yeah, man, just, just the Ross documentary alone, you know, uh, I, I watched it the day it came out and it was amazing, man. It did such a good job of highlighting the history and the people behind the brand and their story. And, you know, it, it's, I think it did a really good job of humanizing the whole thing and showing that this is not just, you know, gear. It's not just an overdrive or a chorus or, bringing yeah. back an old compressor it's like no there's a whole story here that's cool that's important to me i mean i it's it's I, you know it's more important than the pedals even i i just love the stories and stuff the pedals the pedal circuits were the easiest part of the whole thing um but yeah it's cool that it's it's awesome to have worked so hard and then see the impact that a, just a good story has, you know, we got so we got inundated with messages of like, you know, basically like grown men saying, man, I cried about pedals, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, which feels a little crazy, but, uh, but you know, it is, it is, there is something about the humanity and, and all of this stuff we do. And uh, it feels good in a world where it's like, algorithms like subscribes and all this stuff to just like man humans make stuff and we're good at it and telling those people's stories like bud ross's story to me was so wild that i'd never heard it really told um it's just a cool story you know a dude from nowhere coal mining town in virginia moves out to kansas and starts this like guitar empire just such a crazy story yeah how hard was it to keep all of that a secret? Uh, there were points where I just like, it was funny. Cause 
the the drive to Chanute, which is where if you hold an old Ross pedal, it says Chanute on the bottom. There's a the main factory was 110 West Main, and that drives about two and a half hours from here. So I was doing it a good bit, and I just got to where I was like, in my head, you know, I'm like taking photos and like just I'm in Chanute randomly, and I kept waiting on someone to put it together, but like nobody. You know, I I, I kind of quit trying. I was like, yeah, I'm in Chanute, and I'm like interviewing some people about an old company here and like nobody caught it you know nobody it was kind of obvious to me and i was like well you know it was it was hard i mean because i'm doing you know i do the way i do that work is there's this huge uh lift of finding people it's like how do you find the guy like we found the guy that ran the factory like how do you find him well you just dig through family you're like looking at old photos. You're trying to be like, where's this guy? What did he do? And you're asking family members who almost don't know much. You find the people, then you interview them. Then you leave and you dump all the footage and you transcribe it. And then you make these like basically personal Wikipedias about each person and each pedal. And then you're digging through all that. And before we film, we're essentially writing, you know, a 10,000 word essay or more. It was actually more. And then you take that essay and make a documentary. So yeah, it was just a lot. I was like always thinking about Bud Ross and like no one knew I was thinking about it. I would find myself doing stuff like just weird stuff. Like when I came to Nashville, I ran it, you know, we did the little pop-up and I had a situation in Nashville where I saw a custom amp and I found myself just like staring at it. And it was like, <laughs> Yeah, it's like I was in my own world. Oh, and and Rhett, we when we were in Tulsa, the guy had all the custom stuff, and you yeah. you knew at that point. I told you what we were doing, but it was funny. I found myself like interrogating this guy about where he got these custom <laughs> organs. Yeah, but not being able to really bring it up, you know. So it's, it was kind of weird. It's like a weird thing to be so immersed in a subject and then not be able to like have fun talking about it, which internally we were like sick of talking about it. That's what happened is like two years later, we're all like, okay, Josh (laughs) knows like, we know everything about custom and Ross. We need to move on or we're going to kill each other, you know, internally. (laughs) That's, that's the best way. You don't have to create an NDA. You just make everyone (laughs) sick about it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No one wants a natural NDA. Yeah. It's, it's funny (laughs) to have such a passionate, beautiful story that I truly deeply connect with and just be like, Oh man, that was good. What's next? Like, cause that kind of that program, I, I've always been such a fan of documentaries and earliest memories, even like bonding with my dad and stuff were like Ken Burns documentaries. And so getting into YouTube, you know, it's this world of, I never thought I'd make videos period, but then you get into YouTube and you're like, how do you edit? And then you start watching TV and you're like, oh, that was a cut. And then you realize everything's, you know, everything's not what it looks like. Right? I can't even watch a reality show. It's like impossible because yeah. you're like, that's not even the same day. Like, yeah. Yeah. But I think back on those Ken Burns documentaries now that I've done some of this and I'm just like, geez, the dude did like, I think the Civil War is 12 hours. I mean, and this is like, man, this is in the nineties on TV. Like, (laughs) yeah, people don't know. Like, I think with YouTube content, because there's so much of it and it's a lot of it has gotten so good now, you know, like people, I think don't realize how much goes into it a lot of times, you know, where it's, it's not just sitting in front of a camera and then like throwing it into final cut and slapping some stuff together, especially when you're doing what you guys are doing, where it's a, I mean, you're making feature length, almost documentaries at this point, like that Ross documentary is what, like 30 something minutes yeah, long, I mean, half you, hour long. You're getting into like when we did the pack route, when we, you're getting into these history lessons that are just really long. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah it's a ton of work, man. And, and I had a similar experience where I, I haven't taken on a project like what you're doing yet, but it's something, I mean, you and I've talked about it. It's something I'd love to start doing more of. It's just so time intensive and resource intensive that it's like to do it right. You really have to do like what you guys did and take months or years of compiling all the information, finding the storyline, sticking the thing together, shooting it. But then the hardest part is the editing process of making it interesting and compelling 
and keeping people interested for half an hour on YouTube, which is incredibly difficult to do. So yeah, it, uh, amazing job, man. Yeah. Th- thanks. Thanks. It means a ton. I, from someone, I know how, you know, how hard it is. It's like the tension we're in right now as like, I don't even know what we're content creators or whatever. I hate that term, but it's like, I, I don't know what I'm even doing. I'm just like trying to make stuff I love, but it's hard because YouTube is not the greatest place to put something like a Ross documentary. It fe- it doesn't feel serious enough to be take, you know, like, I know mm-hmm. you felt that tension where it's like, where do I even put this? Like Netflix is a thing, you know, but it's like, not, that's not great either. And it's, it's like tons of red tape. And then YouTube, it's like the, the hardest part. This is my old man rant is work so hard on this. Actually, the response is amazing. So I'm not complaining, but you work so hard. And at the end, the amount of anxiety over is the thumbnail cool. Yeah. I want to shoot my eyes out. Oh my God. You're speaking my (laughs) language so much right now. You don't even, this is just going to, going to become a therapy <laughs> session for us. so because just so I'll, you guys know <laughs> people out there our audience i would say our audience is pretty plugged into the youtube world the guitar youtube world for sure the youtubes yeah can i just tell you as a professional titles and thumbnails are the worst part they suck i hate doing them but they are the most important part of the whole process. And it, it sucks that it is this way, but it's the nature of the beast. You know, you have to have the title and thumbnail that's going to grab people's attention. Otherwise it gets to the point where it's like, it's almost not justifiable to make the thing to begin with because you're sinking so much time and resources and you've got employees and I've got employees where it's like, it's not just me sitting in this room making a video at this point. It's like, we're sinking hundreds or sometimes even thousands of dollars into making a video that at this point you've been doing it long enough now too where it's like you you kind of know what a video is going to do before you even put it up most times like i know what a video based on its title and thumbnail like i kind of know what to expect but it sucks man if we could just make videos that said like this is a video about bud ross and ross pedals documentary and it would get a million views, we would all just do that. But it doesn't work that right. way. No, you got to be like, look what Bud Ross did. <laughs> <laughs> you won't believe how Bud You've got to be like, scandal in Kansas. <laughs> like Pedal like, builders <laughs> hate him. You won't believe what he said on it's point like seven. We've, we've, uh, we've created this monster that I kind of hate but I keep helping make it like I'm in an existential crisis. Like you guys are too. I can tell like you're all like your body language is just like, I hate this. It's because there's not another option. Like there's just not another way to do it. And you, and the thing is YouTube is amazing, but it's so it's becoming like, it's really hard to figure out how to do what you do, not burn out, be really happy with what you're making, be proud of what you're making. It's, it's a really tough challenge. And I've found myself lately doing less for some other reasons. You know, I'm kind of in this like reset with how we're filming and stuff, but, but when I do something, I have found myself being like, I need to not care. But what I, what I think about, I always think about you, Rhett. I'm like, I'm in a different boat because there's people who like, you're you're living there i'm i'm not i'm making it i'm paying staff with every cent i get you know i don't make any money from youtube and the expense of it is crazy when you actually i don't want to even add it up but i think about the pressure of like a true youtuber like and the life you're living like that is it's like a beautiful and hard thing to deal Mm with yeah can we talk about how, cause I think that you set the stage really for people to like, for, for like for all the people out there that want to do maybe what Rhett does or what we do where we make things and we have, you have to be present in, in social media and, and connect with people. Um, can we just talk about how important that is for a brand or, or whatever it is you're trying to do in this day and age? I think it, you know, 
yeah. we all know how crucial it is. So like with the, with JHS, for instance, or a brand, are you with Mythos? Yeah. And, yeah. 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 I mean, it's not, it's just a totally different world. Like I remember I made the decision in 2012 ish to just never do print ads again. I was just like, mm -hmm. there's zero evidence. I can't like, like this money is like, how do I deal with this as a small business? I've always feared like when people do things because it's what you should do, I've always felt like I should stop doing it. Like that feels like wise business. If people are just doing a thing because that's how you do it, you probably should think about it. So that's like, I've always thought about that with, with business. So I took those print ad funds and I just assigned Nick, this is back in the day. Nick was like eight years old and um, he wasn't <laughs> eight, but you know, <laughs> and I was like, Hey, I just want you to make videos. I have no idea what that looks like. Let's do like silly commercials. We did all the teasers. We were like, I think we were the, not that this even remotely matters or is, should be applauded, but it was like a teasers for pedal releases, you know, like silly stuff. And uh, we kind of just started with that, but I I've noticed that there's a, there's a tension between the way it was. We're seeing this with like print magazines. Like I was writing the column, this column for several years for guitar, the English magazine. I get the email one day. They're like, yeah, we're no longer printing the magazine. But it's like, you just seeing this stuff like change really rapidly. And so you have people still depending on that. And then you have the obvious things like Nam and just like, how do you, how do you exist with a business because it's just so different? You know, I think the world we grew up in the eighties and nineties and you're watching these movies with like huge budgets and like Pepsi product placements and like million dollar, like, you know, Donald Trump cameos in every movie <laughs> and all this stuff in the eighties. And now it's just, nobody cares. Like nobody cares. So you have this culture now it's in, What's most important, landing the plane, what's most important is, can I relate to that guy that builds the Mythos pedals? That's really right. what people care about. Like, is he a complete jerk or like, is he, is he like, would I be his friend? And I think that's what's happening. And that's why, that's why you have the influencer culture for sure. But I think in guitar gear, it is so obvious right now when people aren't doing that i think it's become really obvious a lot of the feelings of being out of touch you know not that i'm in touch or you're in touch like we all have our own problems but you can really tell when a company's like stranded in 1992 right yeah yeah that's my band i have a band stranded in 92 oh that's not put that on my list right <laughs> We just <laughs> we just play all the grunge stuff before grunge was cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're right, man. I think it does come down to relatability. You know, there's all this interesting stuff with, with YouTube specifically, but now TikTok and and these other platforms where it's like um, people feel like they have. I mean, so m people feel like they have a relationship with the people that they watch. For instance, yeah, like Zach and I are huge tested fans, Adam Savage fans. You know, oh, I grew up on it's Mythbusters. Amazing. It's incredible. Such a great, yeah. I've never met Adam. Zach has, luckily. <laughs> yeah. I but, saw that photo. Didn't you get like eleven seconds with him or something? I I had a few, yeah. I had like, I don't know, maybe a minute. He was he was very okay. patient. <laughs> That's very awesome. nice. But I've been watching him most of my life i've been watching adam savage first on the discovery channel and then for the last 10 years on youtube and i've never yeah. met the man but i feel like i kind of know him and and in many ways that's cool in many ways it's kind of scary and weird uh it's just the reality of where we're at now but i think you're right when it comes to brands or or musicians or artists trying to get out there and be heard and be seen like at least the way the lay of the land is now that's kind of what you have to do i feel like yeah, we had this talk, Bell and I. So Bell is uh, Nick's sister. She's in a lot of the content and she's head. She took over the position of like head of marketing media, meaning she's like the project manager coordinator 
the one that's responsible and keeps me and Nick on the rails. Um, <laughs> that we had this talk cause we, we flew out to Chicago and we did fretboard summit for like three days, did a couple of events there, had the reverb pedal summit, then went to Sweetwater. So we had this like seven day trip. That was a lot of stuff. And I had forgotten because we quit, Na- we quit Nam in 2019. Like I kind of, I'll go do some public stuff. Like I came to the, you know, the pop up and things here and there. Um, but I just kind of forgotten there's the public interaction when you're on YouTube all the time is so interesting. People are walking up and they absolutely know me. Yeah. I have no idea who they are. And they're the first thing, the joke is like, they're always like, you're so tall. That's always the first thing I'm going to get a shirt. That's like, yeah, I'm tall. Um, <laughs> But we were talking about there's this really interesting thing where you can feel and I love that. I I love that it feels that way. I want to be relatable and like I want people to know like, dude, I'm just a guy like I've just worked hard and like I've been fortunate and I'm not special. I I preach that all the time. I'm not special. You know, I just I'm passionate about what I do. I'm a nerd and I'm I'm okay with myself. But it's cool because I'll I'll meet people and you can tell there's this moment where they almost feel overwhelmed because they've been with me so many years and they're trying in a split second to and they realize I don't know them. And it's like uh that's such an inter have you guys had this happen? I know you have. Yeah. 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 It's really beautiful because that's what's cool. I mean, that's a that's a wonderful thing about YouTube and the internet. But it's interesting because in a split second, you know, it, it was like back in the day, I'm trying to imagine, you know, what was it like if you got to meet, like, was it that way? I guess it was if you met like Eric Clapton or somebody, and you know, in the eighties, you're like, I, I've been with you for hours, <laughs> all your songs. There's a similar thing there where there's like, it's a really beautiful awkwardness now because you've added this visual element of like hanging out. I mean, we invest so much time into just like how we run the live chats and like how we're engaging. We have three people in their community and it's like we have become people's community. Yeah, That is so yeah. wild. That's beyond that's beyond the records that we listen to. We actually are like there's a community that's visual and it has its own language and inside jokes like you know, sick burn, like yeah. the retchel slide jokes. Like it's wild. It's like a living community um, yeah. through YouTube. Well, and you and Zach both have this interesting side of it too, where it's like you guys make products that are not just gadgets or or you know, widgets or whatever. You're making products that people use to express themselves and to help find their sound on their instrument, whether it's like you know, a hobby player in their bedroom unwinding after a, a day of work or someone who's going on tour, you know, with a, yeah. with a big artist or whatever, like you guys are both making things that people sort of rely on to express themselves or to work with or to write with or to use, you know, in so there's a connection there too. Like bef- years before I knew you, Josh, I owned several JHS pedals and I, I bought them when I was, you know, a working guitar player. You emailed spending- me for an artist endorsement. <laughs> I did. <laughs> uh, yeah. Should we tell that story? I've never told this story. <laughs> Dude. I, yes, please. I sent you the email, right? I found the email a few years I, ago. I, I, don't, I can't remember. I love it, though. It's such a good story. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm, what I'm saying is like you guys have this extra connection with people aside from just the YouTube and the content creator side. Like you guys are giving people yeah. tools that they use to express themselves and feel connected with you know yeah um, absolutely but yes i did email you when i was 22 <laughs> uh, can we please hear that story please okay. <laughs> this was like 2012 i think uh i had just gotten out of music school and i didn't know like i i had heard of like what an artist endorsement was right and so the way i, I figured was like oh yeah you just if you're a pro player you just email these companies and then they just like give you gear <laughs> so i did i i looked up the I think it was like the info at jhs.com or whatever. And uh, I sent you guys an email and I went back and found it a few years ago and, and texted it to you. Cause there's no way you think, ever saw it. It would during the musical. I think we pulled it up. I probably did. I mean, we were really small back then. Yeah. In 2012. Were, were you in now, Kansas yeah. city yet? Yeah. 
Okay. Well, so yeah, 2012. Yeah yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I wrote this email. I'm 22 years old. And I think all I was doing at the time was like playing church gigs around town. I was teaching lessons full time and like playing church, mega church, Atlanta gigs. And I like wrote you guys this email said, Hey, I'm Rhett. I'm a, I think I said like full time professional guitarist. Cause I wanted you to know that I was both doing it full time and I was a pro. Mm, and yeah. I said, uh, here are the churches that I play for that you've never heard of. Uh, here's, I think I just started playing with Noah or something and I sent you a video link or something like that. And I was hoping to get some kind of artist deal endorsement on like a morning glory or something like that. And whoever it was emailed me back like a it was day Zach. later. Yeah. It would okay. have been Zach. So yep. Zach emailed me back and was like, Hey Rhett, thanks so much for, you know, interest in JHS. We're so glad that you're, you like what we do. Uh, and that's so cool about your gigs. Unfortunately, we're not taking on any more, <laughs> artists on our roster right now <laughs> i was like ah oh, damn it man <laughs> and then i just went and bought a morning glory <laughs> so. it's such a good story man you were you were just shredding for the lord and just trying to like <laughs> you know just like get free gear it, man man like that that email that cold call email it's still a thing how many of those and, do you get bro how many do you get I, not as many as i used to that it's i think I, it it felt like, and now it's all Instagram messages. It's like, hey, like, oh, big fan, you know. Can, can we I, talk? I don't, that would bore people to death, but man. Oh, yeah. But Instagram but, is now another email, and I don't uh, know what to do with it right now. I, I it's so I, much. I answer almost every. I probably shouldn't even say this. Almost every message I get, I answer. Um, You're much a saint. to the chagrin yeah, of you are. my family. <laughs> But um, are you just like at all times on Instagram? No, it's just like, I don't know. It's like, if you're not doing anything, I'll just check my message. That's like, like, that's my, okay. my worry stone. It's like, I'm going to check my messages, uh, but I don't have any notifications or anything like that, okay. you know, <clears throat> but, but the, yeah. The artist. Yeah. I would say we used to get some doozies and we used to get, my favorite is, and you can tell me if you've got one of these, uh, it is when someone's obviously copying and pasting uh -huh. the same block and oh. they mess it up. Oh, so I've gotten yeah. many, I would say, I would say maybe 10, right at 10 that were supposed to go to Earthquaker. Yeah. Oh, that's what so, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. And I will actually, I love them because I would always respond and I would just like, pull, I would just draw it out. Cause it was just so fun to me. Like, Oh, I see what you did there. I don't make the uh, disaster transport, but let's talk about how I could endorse you. Because <laughs> it's always, they'll, they'll like leave, they're supposed to like edit the one piece and they'll uh -huh. like mess it up. It's like, I love JHS, the integrity of the company, what you stand for and stuff. And I, the dispatch master is one of my all time favorite pedals. <laughs> Man, I've, my version of that is, uh, and I don't want to put anybody on blast here, but I've gotten several emails over the years from some very well-known, very reputable pedal and guitar companies that do that thing. Like, hey, and they'll just leave it blank. Hey, parentheses, <laughs> influencer slash channel name here. We love your content. We've been watching for years, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, we have this new tube screamer coming out. And we were wondering if you'd want to feature it on your channel. Like, yeah. But that's rough. Dip, that's dip rough when you can't even like... <laughs> Yeah. Is it uh, just a giant BCC? <laughs> no, it's it's individually labeled. Like it's individually sent. They just copy paste it and forgot to put my name. At least, you know, yeah, it's totally unrelatable problem. But <laughs> one of one of my favorite things for dipped, um, and all the people if if, if if they're not actually watching, but the, like the companies that want us to you know sponsor, they want to sponsor us that have just like you know nonsense stuff. They'll Great always just mention. Legends. <laughs> yeah rage shadow <laughs> they always just mention ret and so sometimes i'll respond is like hey what about me i'm zach i'm the other guy and they'll go oh i'm sorry and then i never respond to anything else but anyway <laughs> it's amazing it's, like um, it's going to turn into a therapy session yeah that's fine um so before we before you hopped on josh ret and i were talking about you know you you brought you you brought ross back Mm -hmm. Are there any other legacy pedal brands or anything that tugs on your heartstrings to bring back? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Could you name them? Or is that a secret? No. I can't <laughs> no. name them. I mean, Ross took two years. That's what I'll say. You know, it's, yeah. yeah. So it it's, I've, I've attempted to do such things since 2017. I almost had an arrangement with a, an English brand that I love. And then I've learned a lot about, I've just always, I just really love the history element so much that it feels like this really natural piece of being able to tell those stories and then, and then move the story forward. Um, yeah. So it's a very natural, like, yeah, this makes sense. And, and I think we've gotten really good here at over the years. Like one of my favorite things to do is like taking some classic thing and replicating it perfectly. Like, I love the science of that. I, you know, I love getting in a forum and it's like, he just clones the tube screamers. It's like, well, make a bonza. You know, that's a difficult pedal to make. Oh, it's like yeah. really to do it really well and, and scientifically and analyze it well. So, you know, we did the muffaletta, the bonza, the pack rat, and then even like legends of fuzz, like I'm so particular about those have to be perfect and the sound has to match the old unit I have. And so I love that process of like, it's almost like this weird, like cloning with a purpose or something, you know, not just, right. I like that idea of, I really like it. I, 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 there's a lot I could say there, but there's something great about there are there are people in our industry and I love them. I think of Joel at Chase Bliss, like freaking genius for president. Like he has this brain that is very much not mine. My, my, uh, there's some people that just like they'll move things forward. And then some of us, I, I really passionately love the past. So and I'm okay with that. And people can call it whatever, you know. The gear page can cream me. I don't care. <laughs> man so when we did the musical a few years ago that was the first time we came out there and hung with you guys and and i got to see the room that you're currently sitting in which most you people realize seen you on. just said when we did the musical you know how weird that sounds <laughs> <laughs> not as weird as the other thing we did that hasn't seen the light of day yet that i kind of hope doesn't but you know that's a whole other whole other thing but <laughs> when i saw that room for the first time yeah. It is so impressive seeing it in person, not just because of all the pedals and, you know, the sheer number of stuff yeah. that's in there, but the, the, like the detail and sort of the completion of everything, how you have like, not just, you know, every boss pedal from this era to this era, but every color of every boss pedal. So my question is like, when did the collection start and did it start out as just collecting pedals or did you always have this idea of becoming almost like a like a curator of pedal history yeah i <clears throat> i i can i can pretty definitively state it happened when i did the muffaletta um way back i mean 2002 i would say there's stuff way back which is like i bought a a vintage rat for $15. A guy came, I managed a music store and he came in, the owner didn't want it. He's like, you can have it. I bought it from the guy for $15. And I remember like having that little moment of like putting that on my board and being like, yeah, it's old, you know, like there was a thing there, but I never like fixated on it, but I remember being interested in that. And like that, there was like this little small seed of whatever chaos I'm now in. And then I think with the muffaletta, um, we were in the other building on main street down here and I had this big eight foot folding table and I had the idea. I came in, I had my notepad and we were so ridiculously like not capable of pulling this project off, but we, we did. And it was just very like young and like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I want to make a pedal where I perfectly pull apart all these real vintage units, big muffs because everybody claims all the big muffs are so different and stuff. I'm going to do the research. I'm going to do the work. Like, I don't want to just pull a schematic off free stomp boxes or something. I want to like, I'm going to do the work. So I'm like, I bought them all. I bought all of them, <laughs> like every big muff. And so I'm taking them apart and I'm realizing like, Oh, that's not real. That people have always said this, that's false. And it was like this myth buster, like 
really fun science project. And I'm out there on this little folding table with my notepad and a scope. And like, I had this other guy help me. And then I got John Cusack involved. Once I got the schematics figured out, like make the switching system. And I remember that was like, I was thinking I'm going to die doing this. Like <laughs> this feels good. Cause it was like, I love, I love like the myth busting element of this stuff. I love telling people, no, 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 no. Like this is not witchcraft. These are circuits. Like we're playing things that the tech of a big muff is from the fifties. Yeah. <laughs> like the clipping circuit, Bob Meyer told me to my face in an interview. He's like, yeah, it's just a radio limiting clamp thing that we used to put in radios in the fifties and forties. He's like, I designed it in like 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, and then you go to stuff like a clon and you look at a clon and you're like, it's freaking cool. I love the clon. I hate how much they are now. But it's like everything, the newest thing in a clon is a 1044 charge pump, which I think was invented in the 80s or something. It's like, y'all, this is, I know that we need to feel magic. I get it. Like, I like it too. I, and there's things I feel, and it's important, but I love that element of, proving simplicity of all this stuff and like making it digestible to younger players and like taking the chaos out of decisions. And so for me, that's where the collecting started happening was like every, everything I'd ever heard anyone say about a pedal, I immediately needed to find the pedal and see if it was true. And so it started this like Anything, you know, it, it, it all starts with the classic, like tube screamer chips, yada, blah, blah, all this stuff. And I just kept adding and adding. And then the show, the show was a whole accident and it just fed the fire. It was like, once I had a place to talk about this stuff, I was like, I should buy that too. Oh, I should buy that one. And it was just like, you know, it was, it was like gasoline on a fire. <laughs> um, but it was all out of that thing in me that's like, man, I really want to get to the bottom of it. I hate repeating what I've been, what someone says. Like, I mm. want to know. Yeah. Well, the thing I really appreciate it about it is when you, when you're there and like walking around that room with you, you can point to literally anything on any one of those walls and you, it's not just a, oh yeah, I got that from a guy. It's like, you know what year it was from, why they did that, the typeface on this. Like I remember walking through all the 250s with you a few years ago and you were like the difference between the three screw and the four screw and the, this typeface and then here they went. Here. It's like everything in that room you know about and you care about. It's not just for yeah. the sake of a YouTube backdrop or for sake of like, oh, I'm a pedal builder yeah. and I've got all this stuff. It's like there's real story and lore behind all this stuff. Yeah, I, I love it. I like it more than making pedals. Like I, I like it that much. And I'm I'm admitting it. I'm 41. The show's about I don't know, several years, five years old or so. I'm okay now. I feel I I love JH. I love what I do with pedals. I love products. I love I love that thing, but I really love this more. And like it's to me, like I really do kind of I'm so motivated, like two fifties. Yeah, man, I can tell you the different screen jigs they had and the color yellow and how the power jacks missing on the first run grays and how the big boxes parts came from old radios. And like I I love those threads of like how they were invented. I, I love that so much. So yeah, to me, every I've said in here, every single pedal is a story. And that's what I love. I get a lot of, you know, people come in and bands come through all the time. And, and I get this, but I'm not this anymore. I think I've, I'll say I've devolved. I, I no longer care how a pedal sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I, I mean that in the, in the truest form. Like I, I have a, there's a stack over here. I wish I had a floating camera, but I, all my work that I do, I put in big bins and they have sticky notes and I'm kind of working through some old brands I'm going to do biographies on. And um, I just buy broken stuff all the time. I'm okay. I'm like the guy will be like, it's broken. It's cool. Yeah. I can't, there's like three of these on earth. I, I don't care. It can sit here broken for three years. At least I'll have it. It's like, I don't really buy it to like plug it in and be like, Oh, that's the sound. I don't do that. 
I maybe yeah. I'm broke. I've devolved. I feel like I, you know, there's the people that are like that would die to come in and play through the stuff. My motivation really is to investigate it. Your your ear would just get so fatigued, you know, playing these like oh. everything starts to sound like oh it's another overdrive, you know, like mm-hmm. the, 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 I mean yeah the, yeah that you know makes this total from, sense. Oh yeah 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 your I mean, own my, brand my, like your own brand can wear you out. Yeah, that's how oh, mine is. I mean, I was going to ask you this about the Ross thing. It's like by the time you got through this journey, would you even like them anymore? Like you know, I mean, I'm sure you know you do, but yeah, there's that you point. know to me to me as. When you're so, it's a great question. I think it's important to tell people like creatives and people making things like it's okay to be like, man, a couple of these, I'm really proud of them, but you know, I don't know. Like it's okay to be like that. The fuzz for me was such a beautiful thing to pull that out of the amp. The chorus is my favorite of all the vintage stuff, which actually no one ever loved. The compressor, it's a, it's, amazing but you know i'm just like it's not the most exciting to me mm-hmm. it's already outsold every it, you know and it always will right uh, but it's funny like how that feels making it and being so in it where it there is a bit of white noise to some of the stuff we do as pedal builders and you're trying right. to make stuff for yourself but you're also like trying to run a business and like there's this tension of like I don't know. I never know what to do. Like I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. that has been the hardest thing for me over the past couple of years. But th- for for a while, I would just die on the hill of I have to love it more than anything I've ever played, uh, yeah. and, and not accepting the fact that hey, this is like actually really good, and someone who doesn't play guitar like me might actually like it. Um, I'm finally coming around to that concept because you just, I mean you dig your heels in because all this is a part of you. I mean, your, your pedal brand is your, is your initials. So of course it's going to be like so tied to you, but there has to be a point. And I think this is something like anybody that makes anything has to kind of accept that, Oh, there's going to be a a, a moment where I have to kind of let go. I mean, it's always still you, but you have to let go a little bit. Yeah. I I found that easier. I mean, we're, we're at, 15 ish years and i've i've found it being easier because i do i love collaboration as uh, that would be like what i love about what i do so everything i do all of it i love the history stuff i'm doing now i love all this i love this angle i will die in the history like i know i will like books and documentaries and stuff Secondly, more than the pedals and the pedal company, more than JHS, I love collaborating inside of JHS. I love I love my employees and their ideas. I love I love not being able to do a thing and finding that person. Like I love the team aspect and collaboration, and I think that's been helpful to me because that gives me excitement of like collaborating means something will be made that I can be a part of that I could never make with otherwise. So it always means there's something new and that always feels good to me. It helps yeah. break up that monotony. Yeah. It feels that way as an outsider coming into JHS and just walking around that building and, and meeting people and hanging out there. Like the, the vibe I get is that everyone really wants to be there, enjoys their job. And I think hearing you describe that it seems like you've curated this environment at that company where everyone kind of has this freedom to work within their strengths almost yeah it's it's really important that people have autonomy here like i want people people's the person is more valuable than the job roles and so for me finding the role for the person is the way I do it. I don't really want to fill a role with a person. I want to find that role that the person's great at. And that means shifting people around. And that means telling some people they're not a good fit. And that means that's a lot of hard stuff. Like I'm not a fan of some of those moments, but like this place is really built. It's so important to me. And it can be frustrating because my name is Joshua Heath Scott and it says JHS. And 
we still get emails like, Hey, has Josh repaired my pedal yet? And it's like, bro, I hadn't touched a pedal and you know, I hadn't touched a repair pedal in nine years and people just think I do everything or whatever. And it's, it's so important, you know, like JHS is a group of 40 people and every single person has an, a great autonomy in what they do. They, they have an ability and an openness to come to me and question and, you know, in, in a proper way, like, Hey, we should think about this. Like everyone, every manager could think about rebuilding their department. If it's beneficial, like I like that a lot. And I think, I think that, I think it's important in a, in this style of work, it's like we do creative work, but we're also like a manufacturing company. That's so weird. Like, you know, this, it's like, yeah. You have a bunch of musicians or artists, typically. Most of my employment is artsy people, which I love. So you have these creative, free-flowing, wandering souls meeting production deadlines. It's like the strangest, like, it works. And, and a lot of artistic people are very disciplined. But there's a tension with that. I, I, like, I like the tension of it. I like being able to try to figure that out. I... Uh... Maybe to kind of like wrap some of this up. The Are we going to talk question? about politics and stuff? Oh, yeah, I was actually going to bring up the debates, the Republican <laughs> debates. To see, yeah, see what you I was thought we would get to talk about politics and religion, but I, is that today or? <laughs> well, that's our other that. podcast. That's a <laughs> dipped after dark. <laughs> um, we should do a dipped after dark. Thing. Dipped after dark. Oh my god! It'd be like a uh, Good Mythical Morning has Good Mythical uh, Evening or whatever yeah. it is. Dude, we should. Totally <laughs> that's do that. really funny. Oh my God. Um, one thing that I get asked a lot is how do you get started in this? And, and, and like from people that want to do it or they're starting out, yeah. uh, you know, right at the very beginning, they've got an idea. Um, how, what advice would you give to someone that wants to get into the pedal game apart from don't? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that <laughs> the best trope response for the last 10 years is like, don't do it, man. You know, that's <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It's a tough one. Um, I still get asked that a good bit. What do you say? And then I'll go, I want to know what you say. I, I mean, I, I kind of go back to what we already spoke about. I said, you know, as important as your product is, you have, well, you have to establish a brand identity. Um, you have to have a, a, a name or something that is uniquely you, but you also have to put yourself out there. Cause that's the thing that I feel like when, when I started doing this and I was using you as an example and like Paul Reed Smith as an example of, of brand owners putting themselves out there. Um, I think I hit it a pretty good spot and I don't know if it's going to be as easy as other people or, or easy for other people now to like break into this industry. But I think you have to be face forward and, do all the things, all the, the AMAs and the videos and everything. You got to do all of it. Just it's just as important as making a good sounding pedal. Yeah, I would. I would. I just want to say, I think you. I think you have done it better than anyone else I've seen in the pedal world. Oh, like Mythos no. and you. I, I really do mean that. I legitimately have no qualms saying it because I. Because I always I felt a little kooky when I started the YouTube like. Cause I, I was, I had hit a point where I was like, JHS was successful ish. And I really loved the YouTube and being in front. I love the teaching aspect. I'm an introvert and I get exhausted and Nam makes me want to jump off a ledge. You know, I have trouble with interacting, but I, I feel natural teaching and I feel natural on camera. I'm fine with it. Cause I'm comfortable. Like I'm a nerd. I don't, I am who I am, whatever. Yeah. I hadn't seen anyone join me in that until you mm. that's a serious statement i remember telling like a couple of my people was like you should check out this mythos guy it's like i've yet to see a pedal person just be themselves and it was really cool so good well, job thank you and Huge that was something job. that was that was something that my wife was like you know you like you know your gear you know your stuff and yeah. you're fun so just you know don't hide yeah. it yeah just be yourself. And it, I mean, it, and I'm super introverted as well. I've come out of my shell a lot, but yeah, um, same. W when I started this, I, I like, if you, if you had approached me like in public, I would have 
been just like, huh, wouldn't, wouldn't have known what to do. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've kind of turned to 180, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. It took me years, man. When I, I my wife and I'll be married 20 years in September, which is wild. That's yeah. a country song, by the way. 20 years of September, Rhett. Write that down, <laughs> yeah, man. Put that on the list. Um, Rhett and I have a, I can't get off on this tangent. Anyway, um, it's about a country band. We Did I tell you about the, the idea I had for secondhand sunblock? <sighs> Come on, Matt. Like that's. So, so it makes me want to grab a it guitar It writes right itself, now. man. <laughs> it does write itself. It's like, <laughs> what was that? Okay, 20 years of September. <laughs> Great country song. Um. I, I never like, I didn't know how to talk to people. Like my wife is very extroverted and we've kind of crossed. It's been this really wonderful, like, that's the great thing about marriage. Like when you commit to that, we've crossed and she's taught me a lot about how to just be okay and like get over how I feel about myself, you know, my existential crises as a introverted artist. And so I find myself like over the years, just you know, presenting at Sweetwater and like going in and pitching my brand and showing up at stores with pedal, like just doing it, you know, just against every fiber of my being doing it. And then I just, something happened and I was like, this is me. Like, yeah. and I have to be careful because I'll exhaust myself, but you've done a really good job at that. So I guess you're the question. I'll, I'll try to answer the question. Um, Yeah. Number one is the, in the pedal world, I think what I was saying to you is, is, is I say that about you because you've done such a good job with what feels like obvious problems with other brands. And that is you are comfortable with yourself and you're true to who you are as a brand. Like you're letting yourself be a brand. The choice to be a personal brand is a hot choice. It's a hot take. Yeah. Yeah. It's controversial. Sometimes I wish I'd called my pedals like jumping jacks, catfish tone devices or something. Oh, I, hell yeah, there's still time. Anybody can have that. <laughs> that <laughs> anybody can have that. <laughs> like I've struggled, but I know, I know that I know that personal brand has done what it's done for my brand. Me just being myself. So like, I think there's a thing there. If you're not going to be a personal brand owner, you need in this day and age, it is paramount to figure out who is going to be the face. You have to have somebody, you have to. Like I there's nobody's buying the bull crap anymore. Nobody's buying the mega mega, you know, corporate America guitar like it's over. Like it's not going to happen. You can't there's no more Dodge truck commercials for guitar. Like it's just not a thing. I like that's a good analogy. It's like those truck commercials. It's like you can put your truck in our truck, towing <laughs> capacity of nine trucks. It's just like that stuff's over and people want to connect. The second piece of that is everyone has an idea and they're usually awesome. And they equate that to starting a company. And that's a huge, huge red flag because products are not that important in the long term brand is more important than products i believe that with all my heart because products coming up how many times has fuzz been cool and uncool in the last four years like if you're building you know what i'm saying you yeah yeah so the products are like i mean i watch a lot of shark tank because it's hilarious but like some of the stuff you can't build a company on this, like the pet rock or whatever, like the trends are going to go away. So I always say to people, like you said it much quicker than I'm rambling on about, but brand is so important. You can have a great pedal idea, but man, you better have a better brand. You Because yeah. if you're going to make a career, that's the people, like if you're saying to me, how do I start a pedal business and have a career you need a brand. I don't care how great your product is. And I was, the example I use here is the Klon Centaur. Great pedal, better brand, period. I could talk yeah. for 8 to 12 hours about this one pedal. The Klon Centaur is a great pedal, way better brand. That's how good of a brand it is. The brand is so freaking good. It's mysterious. It's hype city. It's gooped. It's got a freaking centaur on it. Do, the do colors you remember the old good. website? 
their old website? Yeah. Clon yeah. Siberia. What does that even mean? Weird. What does Clon <laughs> Siberia mean? The 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 intrigue of this is like, am I buying a pedal or like a weapon that Jason Bourne owned? Like, what am I doing here? Like, the brand thing. Anyone can make a con. It's a pedal. It's a stinking overdrive pedal. There's no magic, but no one will ever have that brand. That brand is fire. Like, yeah. I'm super, like, this subject to me is so good. And this is why I think some of these cloning, blah, blah, blah conversations are just, some of them are bull crap because I don't, to be frank, I will, I have done this. I'll just give you my schematic. I don't care. You'll never make a JHS pedal. No. You can make the pedal. I don't care if you make the pedal. G have fun. But you can't take my brand away. And I think mm -hmm. that's what people are missing in that in that bit. Then I would say point four. Point two is really rant, really ranty. <laughs> point four is like just stick around. Yes. The biggest problem most people have is they give up so stinking fast. But see, in the pedal world companies drop like flies and if you just stick around you'll be amazed that seo starts working you're in the search engine you're in the forums you just stick around just stick it out and i and i know that's easier said than done in some cases but like that has been a huge proponent of certain people just if they just stuck around um yeah and just and just just be true to yourself. I think, again, aside from the brand, I think there's an element of you as a person. If you end up with employees, if you end up paying taxes, if you end up with, you just got to be true to making sure you're not making what the gear page or gear slut says you should make. God help gear sluts. You're not doing what they say. You got to do what you want to do because I'm 15 years into this and I've almost quit like four times. But I keep going because I, I make sure I'm doing what I want to do. That's why the YouTube pivot was so big for me, because I was sick of making pedals, to be frank. But yeah. if I'm happy making what is in me to make at the moment, I can keep going for a long time. If I keep playing the, like, make gear page happy, I'll just, I'm going to quit. I will literally go work at Lowe's. Like, that's where I'm at with that. And I've felt, I know you guys have felt that in your careers and that's some of the tension because you need to sell a product. So you do need to sell out. Every business sells out, but how do you do that? That's hmm. like really tough. I think I'd said way more than you asked, but like, that's just like the full feeling of like the full thing is like good brand, be true to you, stick around and sell out in a way that you're happy with and that keeps you making what you love to make. Mm. That's really great advice for more than just starting a pedal company. That's like, I would, I would take that advice for anyone who's trying to just step out on their own and do something with their name on it or with their yeah. creative vision behind it, whether it's pedals or music or YouTube videos or whatever, like all of that stuff applies to I think what we all do, especially the part of not worrying about the gear page because those people exist to be unhappy. So yeah. the gear page gets a lot of hate for me because they're just easy. I actually haven't been in a while, but yeah, I, I that that example is a broad stroke of like people are always not gonna like me. You know where I'm at with that? Fine. Like I can't <laughs> <laughs> like I feel like I sound like a grandpa that needs to have a cane and like a bowl of Quaker oats or something, but I'm just like, fine. I, yeah. I, I'm, there's something about being comfortable in that skin. And like what I was telling Zach, like he's done a good job of like, you're just you, I can tell that you're actually you. And it's so refreshing. I think a piece of that is accepting. And I don't know how, what level you've done this, but it feels Zach, like you've done this, you know, people hate your company for some reason and you're like cool yeah oh I, yeah I, that yeah that's good I, that's like yeah. good yeah it happened early <laughs> after a nam video so yeah it's like oh okay <laughs> yeah. yeah oh well it took yeah. me a few years to get there but actually josh you helped with that like talking to you about that for you know a few years ago it was like oh yeah no no matter what you do people are always going to find something that they don't like 
And it's so easy for them to just sit in front of their computer behind a keyboard and talk shit about you and what you're doing. Yeah. And at this point, yeah, I think we're all in that place of like, cool. You don't like me. You don't like my videos. You don't like JHS or Zach or this podcast. Like, okay, it's not for you. Yeah. We're not making it for you. And that's okay. We don't have to make stuff for, we shouldn't make stuff for everybody because you yeah. can't, not you, a, you can't do that well. Yeah. There's not a person in the history of earth, a product or a brand that is not divided and polarized between people liking it and not liking it. So that's across the, there's nothing universally. There are people that will say oxygen is bad. There literally are. <laughs> We live in a cesspool of opinion. And so if you're the, the biggest thing is if the, if you're making your decisions on being liked, you're done, you're done in some capacity. Like it's going to kill you hmm. because no one's ever liked everything. Like you can't do it. And so I think it's important. The like buttons really screwed with us. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it really has like, there's a lot to be said there. I don't want to, turn into that guy but like there's a lot to be said about the motivation for making things cannot be so that you're liked mm -hmm. and, and i just need that needs to be a t-shirt yeah i, I think but it's, it's i think one thing about makers though and i don't know if you know this is entirely true but i feel like a lot of us were not necessarily like the popular kids in school so we came from a place where like you kind of are like the black sheep or the outcast a bit yeah. and you you're able to to weather that storm a little better than some, but it, it, if you've never had yeah. to experience that, it's definitely something you just have to prepare yourself for mentally. And it's true. And everything. I feel like we're, most of us are the outcasts, mm -hmm. the weird, like the quiet, weird or the loud, weird kids. And we just, yeah. I, I mean, it's, look, it's super you, true. you have to be weird to choose to do this for a living. I have like, a proton pack right now. <laughs> Oh man. And that's oh. movie accurate, by the way. That's the real deal. <laughs> that is film accurate. Oh, I wanted to say. This is so good. Oh. Hey. Thank you. Yeah. That's so good. It's on my eight foot folding table of new products from people. So it's it's at the top. It's so well, good. You'll get to it when you get to it. I appreciate it. I'm glad well, you like I've it. Been, We're really I've been proud playing through it. It's great. It it'll pop up. You'll see it. Oh, okay. it's cool that Josh got his his before mine. That's cool. I get it. I understand. It's cool. I just, you know, it's it's, it's fine. I'll get I got, you I got one. to play the prototype. You know, it's fine. I'll I'll, I'll put it in the <laughs> mail this week. Oh man. Anyway. Yeah, that was some great advice, man. I uh like I said, I think that that resonates for anybody out there who's wanting to do anything creative. Like if you are thinking about taking the step to put your name on something and make something and then choosing to put it out in the world, there's that's a really big decision. And I would say the fact that you're even thinking about doing it means you should probably do it because it means you want to do it on some level. Even yeah. if you haven't admitted to yourself that you want to do it yet, the fact that it's even rattling around your brain means it's something you should pursue. And Josh's advice is, uh, is sage. Yes, very true. This is fun. Yeah. I'll come on to dipped at night or whatever it's called oh, later. Dipped after dark. We should do that, man. <laughs> we should we should sit around and drink bourbon. Maybe I should come up to to Nashville or we should all get together. Josh, you should do this with us. We'll do dipped after dark. We'll all get together in the same room. Maybe it should happen at NAM or something or some kind of event. Just we'll like just, a four hour live stream. We'll live stream like yeah. a presidential debate or something. <laughs> It'd be That'd great. be fun. That'd be fun. <laughs> Because that's where we finally right. get to talk about politics. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. That's the whole idea. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks, Josh. Yep. Thank you, guys. I think that might be one of, if not my favorite, interviews on the podcast in our three-year history. Yeah. he's Josh is such an easy guy to talk to, but he's also so knowledgeable and well-spoken about all the things he, he is talking about that it just makes for a great time. No matter what, we could literally be talking about anything and it would be fun to watch. But I think he he really like, man, some deep nuggets of information strewn about in that podcast. Just be thankful I didn't lead him down the bike uh, or camera, oh, yeah. film camera rabbit hole because we'd have been here for six hours. Oh, that, that'll be <laughs> dipped after dark. You guys can... <laughs>
No, he is great to talk to because he's, he's genuinely thoughtful about everything. Like you, when you're, when you're hanging out with Josh or talking to Josh, you're not getting any kind of, you know, there's no bullshit with that guy. He's every response, everything he tells you and says is there's a lot of thought and energy and, and uh, just sincerity behind what he says and what he does. And that's what makes him such a cool guy. And uh, yeah, so yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Are we shilling? Yes, we're shilling. Can I go first? Yeah, you go first. All right, because, well, because he mentioned it already. I can't speak. Hey. The Fates. There it is. Finally. It's here. I'm I'm super excited. And um, this was this was a long journey. I'm very happy that that this is done. <laughs> but um, the reception has been really great uh, after the uh, the the launch videos and and the people getting to try it uh, at the events and stuff. So they are out in the world and we're building the next batch. This is like it, it's funny like to say like I'm building batches, but that's like you know manufacturing. You make like a certain number like, yeah. at a time. Mm-hmm. So people get confused that it's like a limited product. It's not, but, uh, but yeah, I will get yours to you. I promise. But <laughs> the fates is in the wild. I really love the color of that enclosure yeah. and the, the typeface you picked for that. I, it looks really good. You know, what's funny is even like before I even noticed uh, the A kind of looks like a water droplet, like oh, the, yeah. the center of the A. And I was like, Oh, Hey, look at that. Look at it. <laughs> but my favorite thing is that the, uh, the rate LED is flat. It's yeah. kind of hard to see it, but that was like a last minute addition because I knew I was going to have a rate LED and uh, I went to one of my LED suppliers, I'm not going to say who, and uh, found these flat ones. And I was like, oh man, they'll be perfect. And then we put it in and I was beside myself. <laughs> that <laughs> is so peak happy. pedal builder right there, gatekeeping your LED supplier. I mean, you know, like everyone's got Google. Like, <laughs> you can yourself. figure it out but i'm like why should i <laughs> i will say uh for for the people that are still stuck around in the episode um you and i are working on some stuff that will mm. come out next year and uh, i've been privy to kind of the the process here of like what it takes to actually pick things like switches and knobs and leds and it's not easy it's like there's it's n- a lot that goes into it yeah yeah like finding the right like it's not even just about like the look or, or the mechanics of it. Like sometimes you'll find something that on paper would work perfect and then you get it and it's like 10 millimeters too tall. And you're like, yeah. oh, I can't, you can't put it in. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a deep rabbit hole and it, it I don't know, we'll get through it. I, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my shill is this. Oh. All right. That's the beat up telly. Yeah. The ugliest relic telly i've ever seen so this happened because i was doing a uh, video five levels of telecaster uh for my main channel and i I partner with sweetwater on those they always sponsor those videos and and they send out the guitars so the way those videos work is i'll just go on their website i'll see what they have in stock in each of the price ranges and what i think will make interesting for for the video and um the nice thing is with uh with the guitar gallery sweetwater with especially with these like higher end custom shop guitars, you can actually go in and pick a specific one. So I picked this one because I thought it had just the most hideous relic job. And I knew it was going to look good on camera and it was going to grab a lot of attention and make people angry. And I thought it was gonna make a good thumbnail. So I picked it Mm -hmm. and uh, with no intention of like keeping it. um, I always send, you know, send the guitars back. I've got too many guitars as it is, but I pulled this one out and uh, this was right before we were getting ready to go out and play in Nashville. Um, So we were in rehearsal and I played it in rehearsal and was like, damn, this is, this is a good telly. This is a really good one. That was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, the oddest thing about the relic on that, like hold it up again. So it has all that arm wear and normally, and a lot of times they'll do this. There's that little wear in between the bridge and the control plate where like you'll put your finger and it's not there. (laughs) Yeah. It's look, it's not very correct. It's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, But who the hell cares? It sounds good. It feels incredibly good to play. Yeah. Um, this has like been the only guitar I've been playing since it showed up a few weeks ago. Uh, so yeah, I talked to Sweetwater and we worked out a deal and uh, I'm keeping it. And um, you should find like a really cool old sticker and put it on that front where it's like really worn over on oh, the lower yeah, out yeah, there. That'd be cool. Like something like it's like an old like racing sticker like or speed something shop like something. Or yeah, 
Yeah, what's interesting idea. though is like since I've been playing it, I've been legitimately adding to the relic. So if you look at you mm-hmm. see those white spots on there, that's where the the lacquer's chipping off <laughs> since I got it. Uh hey, that's what it's there for. Right? So even if I wanted to send it back to Sweetwater, I'm not sure that they would take it. I also didn't ask if it was okay if I took it on the road uh for a weekend. I just did <laughs> and spent the weekend in the trailer in like 90 plus degree heat in the guitar vault. And it's fine. It's telly, it's fine. It's fine. Um, turn the trust rod if it's <laughs> yeah but I, but I did that and it man it's a ripper it's a it's a great a great telly so you know it was oh, a very nice guitar uh, the custom shop stuff whether it's fender or gibson you know it's it's hit or miss i've played a lot of custom shop fenders that are just like oh, okay it's good but is it fifty five hundred dollars good no is it six thousand dollars good no same thing with gibson but when they're good when you find the one that like resonates with you it's good yep you're you're moving money around you're clearing off the credit card yeah do you, do you take paypal credit yeah, yeah. <laughs> like those sort of things yeah so, oh uh, man there you go sweet the workhorse awesome. black guard needs a name but uh we don't have to do that now it, it can, it'll it'll come naturally we don't have to i'll think about and, it i'll tell i'll tell matthew <laughs> he'll come up with something good yeah. uh so thanks to all our patrons over on Patreon. Thanks for supporting the show. If you want to learn about it, click the link in the description of the show notes and you can find out all the details about supporting Dipped in Tone and joining the community over on Discord. Yes. And thank you to Sweetwater for sponsoring today's episode. Links to everything out are in the description and in the show notes. If you're listening, uh, you know, be like Zach. Start looking for some, you know, 335 or, or something. Oh, Maybe on the on the marketplace. See what's up there. It, if the gas bug hasn't bit you, just go to Sweetwater and spend five to ten minutes on there and you'll get bit. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks to Josh for joining us today. Um, be sure to subscribe if you haven't done so already. And if you're listening, leave us a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to your podcast. It helps new people find the show and we greatly appreciate it. Yep. Cool. Bye. All right. Catch you all soon.